When Vince Foster left his White House office on that July day in 1993, he told his secretary that he would be back. But the deputy White House counsel and boyhood friend of Bill Clinton never returned. And almost three years later, theories and speculation about his mysterious death live on. On July 20th, 1993, Vincent Foster's body was found here in Fort Marcy Park in Northern Virginia, just outside of the District of Columbia. But that's about the only thing about Foster's death that all parties can agree on. How Foster's body got here, even how Foster died, is still not clear. The 1994 report by independent counsel Robert Fisk says the evidence overwhelmingly supports the conclusion that Vincent Foster killed himself in Fort Marcy Park and adds, quote, there is no evidence to the contrary. But that is simply not true. Here are just some of the inconsistencies, many from Fisk's own report. Police say Foster walked to the edge of this steep berm, sat down and pressed a 1913 38 caliber pistol deep against the back of his mouth and pulled the trigger. The gunshot wound should have been extremely gory because a large caliber handgun often leaves a large wound while the heart typically keeps pumping, leaving a lot of blood and brain tissue called blowback all over the weapon. There was none. The coroner said the exit wound for the 38 caliber bullet was only about one inch wide. There was an unusually small amount of blood under Foster's head and no bone fragments. No bullet was found either, even though searchers managed to find all sorts of ammunition dating back to the Civil War. Powder burns indicate Foster's hands were not on the grip of the gun when it was fired. His teeth were not damaged from the recoil of the 38. There was no trace of soil or grass on Foster's shoes, even though he supposedly walked 700 feet through the park. No one in the park that day ever saw Foster alive. No one reported hearing a gunshot. Foster's fingerprints were not on the weapon. Foster's wife had trouble identifying the gun as her husband's. The 38 was made from two guns fitting the classic profile of a hard-to-trace drop gun, often used to make murders look like suicides. Foster was covered from head to toe with carpet fibers. Blood tracks on his face and shoulder indicate his head had been moved in as many as four positions after he allegedly pulled the trigger, even though death was determined to have been instantaneous and blood trails from Foster's nose and mouth inexplicably defied gravity and traveled upwards as he lay on the steep slope. Critical crime scene photographs are missing. The first paramedics on the scene from this fire station in McLean, Virginia said they found Foster lying perfectly straight as if ready for the coffin and suggested later they thought it was a homicide. And some of their accounts about where they found Foster's body differ from where the park police say it was suggesting police wanted to conceal the real crime scene from reporters and others. At what point do you begin saying something is wrong here? This doesn't add up. Chris Ruddy of the Pittsburgh Tribune Review is the only reporter known to be working on the Foster death full time. His work has been compiled in the book Vincent Foster, the Ruddy Investigation. There's been a tremendous reluctance by authorities to look into this case. We saw that, that Robert Fisk came along and basically rubber stamped the police investigation. His FBI agents went before Congress and said they, the Park Police made no major errors in their case, which is laughable. Ken Starr, the independent counsel, said he was going to look into this, but we know that he has been unwilling to get to the bottom of this. Starr's lead prosecutor quit last year after he said he was kept from pursuing the case too vigorously. There were plenty of witnesses in the park the day Foster was found, and you're about to hear from one of them. Washington, D.C. resident Patrick Knowlton was at Fort Marcy about an hour before Foster's body was discovered. And he agreed to this exclusive interview with CBN News. Knowlton has passed a polygraph test. As soon as I came up the driveway here, uh, I noticed a brown Honda parked there, older uh, reddish-brown, rust-brown colored Honda uh, with Arkansas license plate. Um, as I pulled in, I saw another vehicle parked maybe four spaces down. I didn't see the license plate. Um, all I saw was a single gentleman sitting in the car. He had the car backed in. But then when the window came down, and he gave me this intense glare like, um, you shouldn't be here kind of look, you should leave kind of look, I, I, I took it to heart that, there was, that he was here for some kind of activity that didn't, uh, he wasn't here to enjoy the park. Uh, that's what I thought. The glare was, uh, was very intense and uh, just made me very, feel very uneasy. 
Knowlton went up into the park to relieve himself, and when he came back, he noticed a dark blue suit jacket, a briefcase, and two empty wine cooler bottles in the brown Honda with Arkansas plates. Knowlton called authorities the next day, but was never questioned until nine months later in 1994. Then in 1995, when he was subpoenaed to appear before a grand jury, strange things began to happen. I was actually beginning to be harassed by well-dressed men um, who approached me um, either head-on or walked at me or walked from the side of me or walked from behind me, just giving me intense glares. Men Knowlton said were clearly trying to frighten him into not testifying. He took witnesses with him when he was followed, including a reporter who verified that it was not his imagination. Then there's the mysterious letter that the White House offered as Foster's suicide note. The letter, torn into 28 pieces, suddenly appeared in Foster's office briefcase after it had already been searched twice. The letter is in fact not a suicide note, and it has no fingerprints on it, even though it was found ripped in more than two dozen pieces. Even stranger, three leading handwriting experts examined it and declared it to be an obvious forgery. But perhaps most disturbing are instances where FBI agents either misstated what witnesses told them or tried to get them to change their story. Knowlton says what he told agents was changed in the official report. When I was showed, shown those um, 302s, I looked at them and I started reading them and thinking, you know, those aren't my words, that's not what I said. The FBI version of Knowlton's statement said that, among other things, he would not be able to pick out the man he saw in the parking lot in Fort Marcy. What in fact I told them was if I had, they showed me a lineup or if they gave me a photo spread, I could have picked a guy out, you know, very easily. With the help of a police artist, Knowlton even sketched this drawing of the man. FBI agents also appear to try to get Arkansas State Troopers to change their account of the time that they learned of the foster death. Roger Perry, a 20-year veteran, was working as Governor Jim Guy Tucker's bodyguard on July 20th, 1993 when he received a call from Helen Dickey, who was Chelsea Clinton's nanny. It was sometime between 6.30 and 7.30 p.m. Helen Dickey called me from the White House and told me that Vince Foster had gotten off work that evening, went out to his car in the parking lot and shot himself in the head. You remember those words specifically? That's the exact words. I wrote those words down on a, on a steno pad. When Dickey called Perry is crucial, because if there is a cover-up of the foster death, it could unravel around the White House claims of when it knew about the death. If the White House knew earlier than it says it did, then that would have allowed officials time to clear Foster's office. On the day he died, Foster left his office at about 1 p.m. Foster's body was first discovered at 5.45 p.m. by a man known as Confidential Witness. Shortly after 6 p.m., Park police and paramedics arrived on the scene. At 6.37 p.m., police at the scene knew that the body was that of White House official Vince Foster. But the Clinton administration says the White House was not notified until 8.30 p.m. It says the staff was not notified until after 9. And President Clinton was supposedly not told until after his first hour on CNN's Larry King Live program at 10 p.m. Perry says Dickey called between 7.30 and 8.30 Eastern. Dickey told the Senate Whitewater Committee she didn't learn of Foster's death until 10 p.m. and didn't call Perry until 10.30. So it was after, well after 10 o'clock. It was well at my best estimation that I called the governor's mansion was 10.30. Okay. Helen Dickey says that she called you at 10.30 at night, Eastern. That can't be. That's, there's no way. Um, when she called me, it was between 6.30 and 7.30 p.m. Arkansas time. And Perry and another trooper have signed sworn affidavits to that effect. Other persons Perry then called affirm that it was early evening. White House phone records that could clear up the discrepancy have not been produced. But when Perry was questioned by the FBI, he got the distinct feeling that agents were trying to get him to say the calls came later. So you got a feeling that they were perhaps trying to steer your memory a certain direction. I think they were trying to get me to say that. It was possible that I was wrong. Former U.S. Attorney Joseph DeGeneva says he's never doubted that Foster committed suicide. But what troubles him is the cover-up that began after Foster's death. It is obvious to me that the lengths to which people went after his death to deal with his office and to prevent people from the Justice Department getting in there leads any reasonable person to wonder aloud 
what was in there, why was it being uh, removed, what were the reasons for it, and who were they trying to protect. Robert and Ruddy says a government cover-up of the foster death carries grave implications for every American. It's not just an interesting unsolved mystery case. If our law enforcement agencies can be subordinated for political reasons, all of us in this country are threatened by that. Friends of Vincent Foster have said they wish the questioners would just let him rest in peace. But it doesn't appear that's going to happen until a few more of the questions about his death are answered. Dale Hurd, CBN News, in Fort Marcy Park in Northern Virginia. During this administration, not 10 years ago, it's a much more serious matter. And a few weeks ago, Special Prosecutor Kenneth Starr appointed a new deputy prosecutor with a background in homicide to, among other things, settle questions about the foster death. Starr's lead deputy prosecutor, Hickman Ewing, told the Memphis Commercial Appeal, quote, there remain questions about Foster's death. Was it murder? Was it suicide? Either way, why? Almost all of those questions have been generated by public documents, documents ignored by the major media, even though they offer a treasure trove of contradictions and mysterious details, details that caught the eye of an astute Texas accountant named Hugh Sprunt. Uh, I'm not a Republican, I'm not a Democrat, I don't consider myself a conservative or a liberal. But Sprunt helped bring attention to the case through his initial investigation. Whoever wrote these official reports, and there have been four on the foster death, uh, they must have expected no one to read the underlying investigative record because the disconnects are so fundamental. Sprunt marvels at all of the basic inconsistencies of the official investigation, including even the color of the gun found in Foster's hand. It doesn't take a color TV to see that the gun shown in this death scene photo is black. Then why do FBI documents suggest that Foster's wife Lisa was shown a silver gun as the death weapon, which she then confirms as her husband's? Lisa is not a gun person, but she knows her colors. Why did she say she thought the gun that killed her husband was this silver gun if the FBI presented her with the black gun at the beginning of the interview? It's, I've tried to reconcile that in my mind and come up with an innocent explanation and I have I don't have one the only conclusion that can be reached is that mrs. Foster was shown a silver gun then there is the confused and sometimes panicky testimony of the Fairfax County EMS workers who found the body one of the first on the scene Richard Arthur thinks that he saw a silver semi-automatic in Foster's hand and during a 1994 deposition to the council for the Senate Banking Committee Arthur became upset when it appears he felt he was being railroaded into calling the death a suicide. Arthur to Senate Banking Committee Counsel Glenn Ivey. From what I saw, there's a question. Now, if I was to take you for your word, then fine, it could be a suicide. But I'm still saying there's a question because I didn't see all that. And if a man put a gun in his mouth and blew his head backwards, how did the gun get under his leg? How come he was laying perfectly straight? How come there was only blood going down the right side of his neck, down the right shoulder? Why not the left? Then the record shows that Arthur became so disturbed that his lawyer had to tell him to relax. Another Fairfax County EMS worker at the scene initially coded the death as a homicide, but all have been warned not to talk to the media about it. Vince Foster was a key figure in both Whitewater and in the firing of the White House travel office workers, the affair now called Travelgate and questions still surround the White House cleanup operations that took place in his office the night he died. These are the White House alarm logs. They show who entered what offices and when. And they show that on the night of Foster's death, there's a mysterious entry into David Watkins and Patsy Thomason's office. Apparently a short time after Thomason logged in herself. It shows something called a MIG group. What is a MIG group? Pritchard got a fishy response from the Secret Service. They first told me it wasn't them. Then they got back to me and said, no, we were wrong, it is our group. Um, and they were doing an alarm check. Uh, and there's nothing sinister about it. And I said, well, what does it stand for? And he said, well, we can't tell you what it stands for, and it's classified anyway. Pritchard thinks MIG Group stands for Maintenance and Installation Group, part of the technical division of the Secret Service. Persons who might be capable of disabling an alarm, shutting off a surveillance camera, or cracking a safe. We don't know if they met with Patsy Thomason or what was discussed, but we do know that later that evening, Foster's office was entered and files were removed, something the White House first tried to deny. And finally, there is the mysterious story of Mr. X. 
In 1993, Mr. X made a series of phone calls to Paul Rodriguez, now managing editor for Insight Magazine, sister publication of the Washington Times. Mr. X told Rodriguez that on July 20th, the day Foster died, he saw a man fitting Foster's description being carried through Fort Marcy Park by two well-dressed men. Mr. X told Rodriguez that the man, who appeared to be drunk, was carried from a car in the parking lot and into the woods. Mr. X said he saw the two men lie the third man down on his back in a spot that matches the location where Foster was found. Rodriguez says he doesn't know if Mr. X was telling the truth, but he knows this. Mr. X recounted details of the case that at the time were still secret. He also says that the man obviously feared for his life. I've dealt with a lot of uh, kooky individuals, um, given the types of stories I've worked on. But I detected a, a true fear. He called uh, sh just about a half dozen, maybe eight, nine times. By way of the sound, they were from pay phones. Usually along highways, you could hear the big trucks. The man was very emotionally upset, very concerned for the safety of, of himself, concerned for the safety of his two children. Mr. X eventually stopped calling and has never been heard from again. He may be yet another piece to the puzzle of what really happened to Vincent W. Foster. The passage of time has not settled the many questions surrounding the Foster death. In fact, as time passes and more information is made available, the more questions there seem to be. What all this proves is that the Fisk report, the official um, ruling on Foster's death, uh, is a pack of lies. Pritchard and others vow that the Foster story is not going to go away. We will find out what happened. And when the public learns the full story, I think it will be um, devastating. Dale Hurd, CBN News. Good afternoon. I have just met with the White House staff um, to basically talk with them a little bit about the death of my friend of 42 years, Vince Foster. It is an immense personal loss to, to me and to Hillary and to many of his close friends here, and a great loss to the White House and to the country. As I tried to explain, especially to the young people on the staff, the, there is really no way to know why these things happen. And it is very important that his life not be judged simply by how it ended, because Vince Foster was a wonderful man in every way. Uh, and because no one can know why things like this happen. I also encourage the staff to remember that we're all people and that we have to pay maybe a little more attention to our friends and our families and our co-workers and try to remember that uh, work can never be the only thing in life and a little humility in the face of this is very very important uh, i also pointed out that we have to go on we have the country's business to do i am keeping my schedule today except for the public events i'm keeping all my appointments and and I expect to resume uh, my normal schedule tomorrow. And then, of course, uh, when the funeral is held, uh, Hillary and I will go home and, and be a part of that. But otherwise, we will go on with our schedule and keep doing our work. No. I really don't. And, and none of, frankly, none of us do. You know, we. His closest friends sat around uh, discussing it last night at some length. None of us do. For more years than uh, most of us would like to admit, in times of difficulty, he was normally the rock of Gibraltar while other people were having trouble. No one could ever remember the reverse being the case. So I don't know that we'll ever know, but for me it's just important that that not be the only measure of his life. He did too much good as a, as a father, as a husband, as a friend, as a lawyer, as a citizen. And we'll just have to, to live with something else we can't understand, I think. I have felt uh, the guilt of blaming uh, for things that were wrong in the White House. I don't think so. 
I certainly don't think, I don't think that can explain it. Uh, and I certainly don't think it's accurate. Thank you.